Imagine bottling a tiny piece of the sun. Um, just hold that thought for a moment. Picture its impossible heat and its brilliant light contained right here on Earth. That idea is the core of what we call nuclear fusion. For decades, it was science fiction, just over the horizon. But something has changed. These machines are no longer just experiments. They're becoming real, working prototypes. They could one day power our world. So what exactly is fusion? At its heart, the idea is incredibly simple. Fusion is the process of joining two small, light atomic nuclei to form one heavier nucleus. Visual deuterium and tritium combine to form helium plus a neutron and an energy burst. Think of it like snapping two tiny Lego bricks together. The universe does this all the time. It is the engine that powers the sun and every other star you see in the night sky. In those stellar cores, immense gravity and heat squeeze hydrogen atoms together, forcing them to fuse into helium. This process releases a tremendous amount of energy. We experience that energy as sunlight and warmth. The secret to this energy release lies in one of the most famous equations ever written. E equals mc squared. Albert Einstein figured out that mass and energy are two sides of the same coin. You can convert one into the other. When those two light nuclei fuse, the new, heavier nucleus has slightly less mass than the two originals. That tiny bit of lost mass doesn't vanish. It is converted directly into a huge burst of energy. You don't need to lose a lot of mass to get a lot of energy. The c squared part of the equation is enormous. Now why is this so hard to do on Earth? In the Sun, gravity does the heavy lifting, creating unimaginable pressure. Here we have to find another way to force nuclei together. All nuclei are positively charged and repel each other, like two magnet north poles. To overcome that repulsion, you need two things. Extreme heat, extreme pressure, temperatures over 100 million degrees Celsius, hotter than the sun's core. At these temperatures, matter becomes plasma, a hot, electrically charged gas. Scientists are chasing two main paths, magnetic confinement fusion, inertial confinement fusion. Powerful magnetic fields hold and squeeze superheated plasma inside a vessel. Powerful lasers rapidly compress and heat a tiny fuel pellet until it implodes and fuses. Both paths aim for the same goal, create a miniature star on Earth. Why are thousands of brilliant people dedicating their entire careers to this monumental challenge? The reasons are as powerful as the reaction itself. First and foremost is the fuel. The most common fuel recipe for fusion combines two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium, tritium. An isotope is just a version of an element with a different number of neutrons. Deuterium can be extracted from ordinary water, meaning our oceans contain enough of it to power the planet for millions of years. It's about as close to an unlimited fuel source as we can imagine. The fuel is not just abundant, it's everywhere. The second huge benefit is what fusion doesn't produce. When a fusion power plant is running, it does not release carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It could provide clean, consistent power 24 hours a day, regardless of whether the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. This is what we call baseload power, the steady energy supply that underpins a modern society. Another critical feature is safety. A fusion reactor, by its very nature, cannot have a runaway chain reaction like a traditional nuclear fission plant. If any part fails, the reaction simply stops. The plasma cools down in seconds. There is no lingering chain reaction to worry about. The amount of fuel inside at any one time is very small, only enough for a few seconds of operation. Of course, fusion is not perfectly clean. High energy neutrons will bombard reactor materials, making them radioactive. This is a form of nuclear waste we must manage. However, these materials generally become far less radioactive, much more quickly than spent fission fuel. We are talking about decades or a century, not hundreds of thousands of years. The challenge is real, but more manageable in scale. To build a star on Earth, you need some very special machines. The leading design in the magnetic confinement family is called a tokamak. The word is a Russian acronym, and the machine itself looks like a giant hollow donut. Inside this donut, powerful magnets create a cage of invisible forces that trap the hot plasma. Other magnets and electrical currents heat the plasma and drive it in a loop, keeping it stable and away from the vessel walls. The largest tokamak in the world is ITER a massive international project being built in France, designed to prove that fusion can produce a sustained energy surplus. A close cousin to the tokamak is the Stellarator. If a tokamak is a simple donut, 
A Stellarator is a twisted, cruller-like donut. It uses a very complex set of external magnets to shape the magnetic field into a corkscrew pattern. While much harder to design and build, this twisted shape gives the plasma an inherently more stable path to follow. In theory, this could allow Stellarators to run continuously with less effort than a tokamak, which often operates in pulses. Germany's Wendelstein 7X is the world's most advanced Stellarator, testing this complex but promising concept. New computing power and three-dimensional printing have made building these intricate machines possible. Then we have the inertial confinement approach, which looks completely different. The most famous example is the National Ignition Facility in California. Imagine a small metal sphere about the size of a sports stadium. Inside, 192 of the world's most powerful lasers are all aimed at a single point in the center. At that point sits a tiny target, a hollow gold cylinder containing a peppercorn-sized capsule of fusion fuel. In a coordinated blast, the lasers fire, creating an inferno of X-rays inside the cylinder that crushes the fuel capsule, triggering fusion. It is a brute force method of creating stellar conditions for just a fraction of a second. Beyond these big three, a whole ecosystem of new ideas is bubbling up, many from private companies. Some are trying to build smaller, more compact tokamaks using new high temperature superconducting magnets, which can create stronger magnetic fields more efficiently. Others are exploring hybrid approaches, like magnetized target fusion, which uses magnets to hold the plasma while it's being mechanically crushed by pistons or liquid metal. These smaller, more agile teams are betting they can build cheaper and faster power plants, creating a vibrant race to find the most practical and economical path to fusion energy. Enabling tech includes high temperature superconducting magnets, advanced materials for heat loads, AI plasma control, and efficient diode pumped lasers. You hear the term net energy gain all the time in news about fusion. It sounds simple, but it has a few different meanings and the difference between them is everything. It is the metric that will decide whether fusion is a laboratory curiosity or a source of power for our cities. The first and simplest definition is what scientists call scientific break-even, or Q-fuel. This is where the energy produced by the fusion reactions themselves is equal to the energy we use to heat the fuel. Getting more energy out of the fuel than you put into it, a Q-fuel greater than one, is a monumental scientific achievement. In late 2022, the National Ignition Facility, NIF, announced they had done just this. Their lasers delivered about two megajoules to the target and the fusion produced about three megajoules. That was a historic moment. But, uh, this is a very big, but, that is not the same as powering a city. The number that truly matters for humanity is what we might call engineering breakeven, or Q-plant. Q-plant looks at the total electricity the entire facility produces versus the total electricity it consumes from the grid to run everything. To power the lasers, the NIF experiment used over 300 megajoules of electricity from the wall outlet to get that three megajoules of fusion energy. A real power plant needs a Q plant much greater than one. It has to power its own magnets, lasers, cooling systems, control rooms, everything else, and still have a large surplus left. Most experts believe a commercial plant will need a Q-fuel of at least 10 or 20 to have a chance at achieving a positive Q-plant. Achieving net energy gain in a single laboratory shot was like climbing a very tall hill. Now, engineers face the task of climbing an entire mountain range to build a commercial power plant. The first major challenge is heat. A fusion reactor is incredibly hot on the inside, but that heat has to be captured and turned into electricity. Surround the plasma chamber with a blanket. High energy neutrons slam into this blanket, depositing energy as heat. A coolant, water or liquid metal, carries that heat to boil water, spin a turbine, and generate electricity, just like a conventional power plant. This blanket has another job, tritium breeding. One key fuel ingredient, tritium, is radioactive and scarce. The blanket is filled with lithium. When a neutron strikes lithium, it can create tritium. A successful plant must breed at least one tritium atom for every one it consumes. Materials present another enormous hurdle. The inner wall and blanket endure intense heat and neutron bombardment, a relentless hailstorm at the atomic level, damaging structures, making them brittle and radioactive. 
We need new alloys and composites that last for years. Reliability and repetition. For an inertial fusion plant, a scientific shot a day isn't enough. A power plant would need to fire lasers about 10 times per second, 24-7, hitting a new target each time with perfect precision. For magnetic fusion, it means keeping unruly plasma stable, not for minutes, but months. The entire system, magnets, pumps, heaters, and control systems, must operate with the reliability of a modern jet engine. This leap from a single successful shot to a continuously operating industrial machine is perhaps the greatest challenge of all. So, with all this progress and all these challenges, when can we realistically expect to see fusion power lighting up our homes? It is crucial to be honest and avoid the hype that has dogged fusion for half a century. The old joke was that fusion is 30 years away and always will be. That is starting to change, but we must still think in decades. The path forward has phases. Scientific gain, 2020s. Demo plants, 20 to 30s. First commercial plants, 20 to 40s. Widespread adoption, 20s to 50s plus. We are likely to see the first demonstration power plants in the 2030s. They will prove systems integration, aim for high Q fuel, generate modest grid power, achieve Q plant greater than one, and test tritium breeding and high endurance materials. Projects like ITER are paving the way. Several private companies are racing to build faster, smaller versions. If demonstrations succeed, the first true commercial plants could begin construction in the late 2030s and operate in the 2040s. These first units will be expensive, serve as blueprints for a future fleet, and initially supplement, not replace, the grid, working alongside renewables. Widespread adoption depends on driving costs down, likely 2050s or later. Even if widespread fusion power is still decades away, the pursuit of it matters immensely today. The push for fusion is a powerful engine of innovation, spinning off technologies and knowledge that benefit us right now. To solve the extreme challenges of fusion, we have to invent the future. Developing new high-temperature superconductors, hyper-efficient power lines, MRI machines, creating new materials that withstand incredible temperatures and radiation, useful in aerospace and heavy industry. Controlling a burning plasma pushes AI and machine learning forward, control systems that react in microseconds to stop instabilities. Powering inertial fusion lasers, the world's most efficient, powerful laser systems. Simulations to design a stellarator and model plasma behavior using the planet's most powerful supercomputers. This work creates a highly trained workforce of scientists and engineers who go on to solve problems across many sectors. Fusion strengthens the case for long-term energy security. Many nations lack fossil fuels and face volatile markets. Fusion fuel from water and lithium is nearly universally available. Fusion would reshape geopolitics, reduce conflicts over energy, enable energy independence, and foster international collaboration. For so long, fusion has been the ultimate what if. What if we could harness the power of a star? What if we had a source of energy that was nearly limitless, fundamentally safe, and clean? For decades, these questions felt philosophical. The gap between the dream and the reality was a chasm. But slowly, steadily, experiment by experiment, breakthrough by breakthrough, we have been building a bridge across that chasm. The work is far from over, but the foundations are now solid. The recent achievement of scientific net energy gain was a trumpet blast, announcing that the basic premise is sound. Now, the symphony of engineering must begin. It will require integrating cryogenics, robotics, materials, science, artificial intelligence, into a single, reliable, economical machine. It is a challenge on the scale of the Apollo program, with potential for even greater impact. We must remain clear-eyed. The path is strewn with technical and economic obstacles. The first plants will be expensive and must compete as solar, wind, and storage costs fall. There will be setbacks. Some designs will fail. But the sheer number of approaches from huge collaborations to nimble startups raises the odds that one or more will succeed. The story of fusion is human curiosity and persistence. Fusion isn't magic. It isn't a fantasy. It's hard engineering, grounded in physics we have understood for a century. Today's machines look more capable. We are checking off impossible problems. The journey is long, but evidence is mounting that we are on the right path.